All right, hello everybody and welcome to our first lecture for American literature. So what better spot to start than at the beginning? So remember Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. So we're gonna read Columbus's first, or his letter that he wrote in 1493, describing his journey to the new world. So let's get right into it, let's go. So first, Let's take a look at this map. Let me take away my webcam here. So Columbus landed in the islands of the Bahamas, okay? Uh, if you don't know where the Bahamas are, here's Florida. Florida is right up here in the top left, okay? He landed at a place called San Salvador. Now, 99% of the resources that I've read say that he landed on this island and called this island San Salvador, okay? 1%, which is one article, said that he landed right here where this red dot is. That island is called Samana K. There's not enough resources or research to make that claim that he landed at Samana K rather than this island called San Salvador. Okay? I just wanted to throw that fun fact in there for you just because that article I read was from 1986 and it was long before I was born, um, but it this is from National Geographic, so there's some um, sense to it. So, but for just simplicity's sake, let's stick with San Salvador being right here, okay? So this is the island of San Salvador. You're like, where did he land? Well, there's this place called Columbus Landing, right where this red dot was. That is where he landed. So, let's get right into it. Let's pull up my webcam again, and let's go to our other tab here. So. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can read it. Okay. So this is Columbus's letter that he wrote in 1493 to the treasurer of Aragon, Luis de Saint Angel. Okay. Sir, as I know you will be rejoiced at the glorious success that our Lord has given me in my voyage, I write to tell you how in 33 days I sailed to the Indies with the fleet that the illustrious king and queen our sovereign. So let's take a step back and let's look at the word sovereign. So sovereign means supreme ruler. This word is going to come up quite a bit in early American literature, especially when we get to uh, Sinners of the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. And we'll, it'll be a while before we get there. But just remember sovereign means supreme ruler. Gave me where I discovered a great many islands inhabited by numberless people. And of all I have taken possession for their highnesses by proclamation and display of the royal standard. So a standard is like a flag or a banner. In this case, when he says royal standard, he means the Spanish flag because Columbus is from Spain. He planted that flag without opposition. To the first island I discovered, I gave the name San Salvador. So let's come over to our map right here, San Salvador, okay? I don't know why my cursor's not showing, there it is. San Salvador, okay? go back in commemoration of his divine majesty who has wonderfully granted all this the Indians call it Guanaham the second I named the island of Santa Maria de Conception the third Ferdinandina the fourth Isabella the fifth Juana and thus to each I gave a new name so let's come back over to our slideshow here take away my webcam so here is Columbus's sailing map okay Sail from Spain, Canary Islands, to San Salvador, which is that back side right there. Uh, then there's Santa Maria de Conception. Then he goes over for Nandina, then Isabella. Then he comes over to this place called Juana, which is modern day Cuba. Remember, Florida is up here. Then he sailed over to Hispaniola, which is modern day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And we'll get to that here when we go to this other map. So here's Florida, the Bahamas. Okay, San Salvador is right here. Then we come over to Cuba, which is Juana. Then this is Hispaniola, Haiti and Dominican Republic. Okay. When I came to Juana, I followed the coast of that isle toward the west and found it so extensive that I thought it might be the mainland, the province of Cathay, China. 
and as I found no towns nor villages on the seacoast except a, fa a few small settlements where it was impossible to speak to be speak to the people because they fled at once. I continued the said route thinking I could not fail to see some great cities or towns and finding at the end of many leagues that nothing new appeared and that the coast led northward contrary to my wish because the winter had already set in. I decided to make for the south and as the wind also was against my proceeding I determined not to wait there longer and turned back to a certain harbor whence I sent two men to find out whether there was any king or large city. So one major thing here a league okay that's a unit of measurement much like our modern day miles or kilometers uh, a league is about 2.6 miles I got that from two resources um, I didn't look too much into it because it, you know it's not going to be exact but it's 2.6 miles so let's say I've traveled 10 leagues traveled 26 miles okay uh, so he sent his people out and explored for three days and found countless small communities and people without number but with no kind of government so they returned so he sent out his men to see if there's any king or large city but there wasn't so they came back I heard from the other Indians I had already taken that this land was an island and thus followed the eastern coast for 107 leagues so take 107 times 2.6 uh, until I came to the end of it. And that, well, 107 times 2.6 .6 will be how many miles it would be just to give you a better idea. Uh, until I came to the end of it. From that point, I saw another isle to the eastward at 18 leagues distance, to which I gave the name of Hispaniola. So Hispaniola is going to come up quite a bit in the next paragraph, and we'll touch on that. Uh, remember, Hispaniola is Haiti to the west and Dominican Republic to the east and it's joined but they're split down the middle so that's Hispaniola um, I went thither and followed its northern coast to the east as I done in Juana 178 leagues eastward as in Juana this island like all the others is most extensive it has many ports along the sea coast excelling any in Christendom uh, when he says Christendom he just means um, his world um, you know Christians uh, the world of Christians so most of Europe Asia all that okay not necessarily Asia but most of Europe but all any in Christendom and many fine large flowing rivers uh, the land there is elevated with many mountains and peaks incomparably higher than in the center Isle they are most beautiful of a thousand varied forms accessible and full of trees of endless varieties so high that they seem to touch the sky I have been told that never lose that they never lose their foliage. I saw them as green and as lovely as trees are in Spain in the month of May. Some of them were covered with blossoms, some with fruit, and some in other conditions according to their kind. The nightingale and other small birds of a thousand kinds were singing in the month of November when I was there. So that's odd to Columbus because where do birds usually go in the winter? South, right? So they were there in November, usually when it's really cold everywhere. Oh. You know, Kansas, <laughs> Spain, all that. Uh, there were palm trees of six or eight varieties, the graceful peculiarities of each one of them being worthy of admiration, as are the other trees, fruits, and grasses. There are wonderful pine trees and very extensive ranges of meadowland. There is honey, there are many kinds of birds, and a great variety of fruits. Inland, there are numerous mines of metals and innumerable people. Hispaniola is a marvel. So over here you see somebody increase the font size and put that in quotes. Hispaniola is a marvel. Uh, so my college professor, when he gave a lecture on the Columbus letters, he, he had us read this letter aloud in class. And he would say, Hispaniola is a marvel after every time someone got done reading, just to emphasize that point. So Columbus is really impacted by Hispaniola especially. So when you say Hispaniola, we're talking about Haiti, Dominican Republic, modern day, right? Hispaniola is a marvel. He is so intrigued by this land. So let's keep reading. Hispaniola is a marvel. Its hills and mountains, fine plains, and open country are rich and fertile for planting and pasturage and for building towns and villages. The seaports there are incredibly fine, as also the magnificent rivers, most of which bear gold. So we get that introduction of gold in the new world that's going to be so intriguing that's why columbus is writing about it 
the trees, fruits, and grasses differ widely from those in Wana. So he's saying, let's come over back over on my map here. He's saying that the trees, oops, the trees in Haiti and Dominican Republic, so Hispaniola, differ from Wana or Cuba. They are different, even though they are probably only, I don't know, 60 miles apart. Then he goes on to say, there are many spices and vast mines of gold and other metals in this island. They have no iron, nor steel, nor weapons, nor are they fit for them, because although they are well-made men of commanding stature, they appear extraordinarily timid. The only arms, weapons, they have are six of cane, cut when in seed with the sharpened stick at the end, and they are afraid to use these. Often I have sent two or three men ashore to some town to converse with them, and the natives came out in great numbers, and as soon as they saw our men arrive, they fled without a moment's delay, although I protected them all from injury. So, Columbus is saying that these Native Americans, they do not have so-called weapons like they do, like the Spanish do. Uh, they don't have iron, they don't have steel, like the weapons that Spain has. They have sticks sharpened at the end. At every point where I landed and succeeded in talking to them, I gave them some of everything. I had cloth and many other things without receiving anything in return, but they are a hopelessly timid people. So he's saying he's he gave them some of everything he had. He gave them cloth and many other things, and he didn't receive anything in return. They didn't give him anything in return. Um, he didn't want anything in return. It is true that since they have gained more confidence and are losing this fear, they are so unsuspicious and so generous with what they possess that no one who had not seen it would believe it. They never refuse anything that is asked for. They even offer it themselves and show so much love that they would give their very hearts. So just think about this because I'm going to ask some questions towards the end of this lecture. Um, what does Columbus think about these Native Americans. So like what kind of people are they? What kind? Uh, what are their ambitions? What What does he think of these people? Okay. Whether it be anything of great or small value with any trifle of whatever kind they are satisfied, I forbade worthless things being given to them, such as bits of broken bowls, pieces of glass, and old straps, although they were as much pleased to get them as if they were the finest jewels in the world. So these Native Americans are so excited to get these things, these even though they're broken bowls or pieces of glass or old leather straps, they're excited to receive these things, okay? Um, so Columbus is going to say a little bit more on this. One sailor was found who have given a leather strap, so a leather strap, for gold the weight of two and a half castellanos, which is just like a gold coin. So he gave this guy a leather strap, and he received gold in the weight of two and a half gold coins. Uh, and others for even more worthless things much more. While for new blancas, so copper coins, they would give all they had. Were it two or three castellanos of pure gold or an aroba or two of spun cotton. Even bits of the broken hoops of wine casks they accepted and gave in return what they had like fools and it seemed wrong to me. I forbade it and gave a thousand good and pretty things that I had to win their love and to induce them to become Christians and to love and serve their highnesses and the whole Castilian nation and help to get for us things they have in abundance which are necessary to us. So what's Columbus's ambition here? To persuade these Native Americans into joining the Christian church and to joining Christianity. Um, so he's hoping that they'll serve the king and queen of Spain as well if he gives them all these pretty and nice things. Then he goes on to say, they have no religion nor idolatry, except that they all believe in power and goodness to be in heaven. They firmly believe that I, with my ships and men, came from heaven, and with this idea I have been re received everywhere since they lost fear of me. So over here on the side it says, they firmly believe that I, with my ships and men, came from heaven. So obviously if someone is a, a, a weird vessel, a weird group of people that you've never seen before or didn't know existed comes to your land, you might be thinking that they're maybe not from this world, right? Um, so let's keep reading. Um, they are, however, far from being ignorant. They are the most ingenious men. They navigate these seas in a wonderful way and describe everything well, but they never before saw people wearing clothes nor vessels like ours. 
Directly, I reached the Indies in the first isle I discovered. I took by force some of the natives, that from them we might gain some information of what there was in these parts. And so it was that we immediately understood each other, either by words or signs. So he's saying when they first arrived, they took some poor natives to try to make sense of this land and try to get a sense of the land. Um, as horrible as that may be, that's what Columbus is saying that he did. Uh, taking people by force, horrible, but that's what he wrote down. Um, they are still with me and still believe that I come from heaven. So maybe they're a little bit more willing to be with him now since they think he came from heaven. Uh, but let's just keep reading. They were, the first, they were the first to declare this wherever I went, and the others ran from house to house and to the towns around crying out, Come, come, and see the men from heaven. Then all, both men and women, as soon as they were reassured about us, came, both small and great, all bringing something to eat and drink, which they presented with marvelous kindness. In these isles there, were, there are a great many canoes, something like rowing boats of all sizes, and most of them are larger than an 18 oared galley. They are not so broad as they are made up of a single plank, but a galley could not keep up with them in rowing, because they go with incredible speed. Uh, and with these they row about among all these islands, which are innumerable, and carry on their commerce. I have seen some of these canoes with 70 and 80 men in them, and each had an oar. So he's describing the ships that these Native Americans use, and they're, they're canoes, but they hold 70 to 80 men, so think about uh, a lecture hall of college students all in one canoe rowing with each having one oar. How fast that would go if they're all on the same time. When you look at these college rowing teams, you know, they, they go pretty quick. Imagine having 70 to 80 people doing that. They'll get around very, very quick. Um, I've seen some of these cute, or canoes with 70 to 80 men, like I said. Uh, in all the islands, I observed little difference in the appearance of the people. So he's saying that the people don't look much different. Or in their habits, their habits aren't much different. Or in their language, their language is much different. Except that they understand each other, which is remarkable. Therefore, I hope that their highnesses will decide upon the conversion of these people to our holy faith, to which they seem much inclined. I have already stated how I sailed 107 leagues among, along the coast of Juana, which is Cuba, in a straight line from west to east. I can therefore assert that this island is larger than England and Scotland together, since beyond these 107 leagues there remained at the west port, or west point, two provinces where I did not go. So he's saying there's two provinces, he refuses to go because the natives say this next line. So keep in mind this next line I've done some research on, there's not a whole lot out there. I don't know what they're talking about with with this province. So he says, one of which they call Avon, the home of men with tails. I don't really know what they mean by that. Um, really not a whole lot of research into that sentence. Um, These provinces are computed to be 50 or 60 leagues in length, as far as can be gathered from the Indians with me, who are acquainted with all these islands. This other, Hispaniola, is larger in circumference than all of Spain from Catalonia to Fuentarabia in Biscay. I can't say Fuentarabia. I've tried. I looked up pronunciation videos. It's hard. It's Spanish. Okay. Since upon one of these, one of its four sides, I sailed 188 leagues from west to east. This is worth having and must on no account be given up. He's saying that this land, Hispaniola, should not be taken by anybody but Spain. I have taken possession of all these islands for their highnesses, and all may be more extensive than I know or can say, and I hold them for their highnesses, who can command them as absolutely as the kingdoms of Castile. In Hispaniola, in the most convenient place, most successful for the gold mines and all commerce, the mainland on this side, or with that of the great Khan on the other. So he's saying that this land is in between Spain and China. It would be great for commerce, great for trade. With which there would be great trade and profit, I have taken possession of a large town, which I have named the city of Navadet. 
I began fortifications there, which should be completed by this time, and I have left it left in it men enough to hold it with arms, artillery, and provisions for more than a year, and a boat with a master seaman skilled in the arts necessary to make others. So he left his men there. He left a master sailor to train others, other people, um, so they can hold that land. I am so friendly with the king of that country that he was proud to call me his brother and hold me as such. Even should he change his mind and wish to quarrel with my men, neither he nor his subjects know what arms or nor wear clothes, as I have said. Um, no, sorry, subjects know what arms nor wear clothes, as I have said. They are the most timid people in the world, so that only the men remaining there could destroy the whole region and run no risk if they know how to behave themselves properly. In all these islands, the men seem to be satisfied with one wife, except they allow as many as twenty to their chief or king. The women appear to me to work harder than the men, and so far as I can hear, they have nothing of their own. For I think I perceived that what one had others shared, especially in food, in the island so far I have found no monsters, as some expected, but on the contrary, there are people of very handsome appearance. So, um... Back then, a lot of people suggested if you would find a new land or new area that there'd be monsters there. Um, but he's telling them there's no monsters here, but people of handsome appearance. So good-looking people. They are not black, as in Guinea. They are, though their hair is straight and coarse, as it does not grow where the sun's rays are too ardent. And in truth, the sun has extreme power here, since it's within 26 degrees of the equinoctial line, the equator. In these islands, there are mountains where the cold this winter was very severe. But the people endure it from habit, and with the aid of the meat, they eat with very hot spices. As for monsters, I have found no trace of them except at the point in the second isle as one enters from the Indies, which is inhabited by a people considered in all the islands as most ferocious who eat human flesh. So, he found some a, a cannibal tribe. Um, people consider them very ferocious, um, obviously. Uh, they possess many canoes, which, which they overrun the Isles of India, West Indies, stealing and seizing all they can. They are not worse looking than the others, except that they wear their hair long like women, and use bows and arrows and, of the same king, with a sharp stick at the end for one lack of iron, uh, of which they have none. They are ferocious compared to these other races, who are extremely cowardly, but I only hear this from the others. They are said to make treaties of marriage with the women in the first isle to be met with coming from Spain to the Indies, where there are no men. These women have no feminine occupation, but use bows and arrows of cane like those before mentioned and cover arm themselves with plates of copper, of which they have great quantity. Another island, I am told, is larger than Hispaniola, where the natives have no hair, uh, where there is countless gold, and from them all I bring Indians to testify this. Uh, to speak in conclusion, just a heads up, if you ever write an essay and start your conclusion paragraph with in conclusion, that is awful, please never do that. Never end an essay with in conclusion. Obviously, you're going to be the last paragraph is going to be your conclusion. Don't start it with in conclusion. Okay, let's keep going. To speak in conclusion only of what had been done during this hurried voyage, their highnesses will see that I can give them as much gold as they desire if they will give me a little assistance, spices, cotton, as much of their highnesses my, may command to be shipped and mastic, as much as their highnesses can choose to send for which until now has only been found in Greece and the island of Chios, Chios uh, and the Signoria, can get its own price for it, much like the Linolo. As they command to be shipped, and as many slaves as they choose to send for all heathens. I think I have found rhubar rhubarb and cinnamon. Many other things of value will be discovered by the men I left behind me, as I stayed nowhere when the wind allowed me to pursue my voyage except in the city of Navidad, which I left fortified and safe. Indeed, I might have accomplished much more had the crew served me as ought, they ought to have done. The eternal and almighty God, our Lord, is who gives to all 
who walk in his way victory over things apparently impossible. And in this case, signally so, uh, because all those these lands had been imagined and talked of before they were seen, most men listened incredulously to what was thought to be but an idle tale. But our Redeemer has given victory to our most illustrious king and queen, and to their kingdoms rendered famous by this glorious event, at which all Christendom should rejoice, celebrating it with great festivities and solemn thanksgivings to the Holy Trinity, and fervent prayers for the high distinction that will accrue them, uh, accrue them from turning so many peoples to our holy faith, and also from the temporal benefits that not only Spain, but all Christian nations will obtain. Thus I record what has happened in a brief note written on board the caravel off the Canary Islands on the 15th of February, 1493. Yours to command the Admiral Christopher Columbus. Um, basically, towards the end in that conclusion, he said, This land and these people are yours to do with King and Queen of Spain. So keep that in mind. Um, we'll talk about some Native American literature in a couple videos maybe even next video we'll see um, but there's a postscript to this letter uh, since writing the above being in the Sea of Castile so much wind uh, arose south southeast that I was forced to lighten the vessels to run into this port of Lisbon today which was the most extraordinary thing in the world from whence I resolved to write to their highnesses uh, in all the Indies I always found the temperature like that of May where I went in 33 days, I returned in 28, except that these gales have detained me 14 days knocking about in this sea. Here all seamen say that there has never been so rough a winter, nor so many vessels lost. Done the 14th day of March. So he's saying it's a horrible winter where he landed in the port of Lisbon. So uh, let's go back to my PowerPoint here. So off San Salvador Island, uh, they have a plaque to commemorate Columbus's landing. This is actually at Columbus Landing in San Salvador on that wet south, west, southwest part. Uh, it says this plaque was presented by the government of Spain on the occasion of the visit of the replicas of Christopher Columbus caravels on the 10th February 1992 in commemoration of the first landfall at San Salvador in 1492. So this is the 500th anniversary plaque of Christopher Columbus's landing. It was given to San Salvador from Spain. All right, so I said I got, I'm gonna have some questions at the end. So what I want you to do, um, think, think about this first and then take out a piece of notebook paper and write down your answers to these questions. I feel like it would help us uh, to kind of recap what was said in this. So our first question is more, you know, command. Uh, describe what Columbus saw on his visit of the islands. List many. So list what he saw, you know, whether it's the trees, for example, or something like that. Uh, number two, Columbus says that the islanders fled without a moment's delay. Based on this letter, why do you think the islanders fled from Columbus? Okay use evidence you know be like oh Columbus said this so that's why I think that the Islanders fled um, overall and the next question overall what attitude does Columbus have toward Native Americans give specific examples again write this down on a piece of notebook paper um, yeah that's all I got for you today I hope you enjoyed um, reading this primary source document of Columbus and his experience coming to the new world. Um, we're going to get to some Native American literature soon. Um, yeah, it'll be exciting. I'm excited to continue this American literature series with you all. Um, hope you have a great day. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.